to get us going on this series of lectures on geopolitics, uh, I really couldn't think of a better person to do this than Ron Granieri. Uh, many of you know Ron already because he is the host of our monthly interactive program called Geopolitics with Granieri, uh, where he plays a combination of William Buckley and Phil Donahue. And he does a, a really great job. Uh, my first uh, introduction to Ron was, uh, I think, when he gave a presentation at our study group on America and the West. And uh, I was so captivated by his uh, gift for metaphor that we tried to figure out ways to get him more involved in the organization. And uh, first, he became uh, executive director of our Center for the Study of America and the West, which he remains. And then we persuaded him to become uh, the host of Geopolitics with Granieri. How we couldn't give it to anybody else with that name. <laughs> and uh, now he's kind of the regular moderator at our panel discussions that are part of the Foreign Policy Roundtable uh, for Rising Philadelphians. Uh, for those of you who don't know him, he, he got his BA at Harvard University, his PhD at the University of Chicago in history, he is, uh, by training, a historian of uh, modern Europe, but he also uh, likes to look at the big picture and to relate uh, the, histor the history to contemporary affairs, which is also kind of the FPRI uh, brand. Um, <clears throat> when you Google somebody, you find out lots of interesting things. Now, I'm not going to recommend that you do this for everybody because you might find out things you don't really want to know. But in the case of, uh, of Ron, there's a lot of things on the internet that really show you how endearing a person uh, Ron is. And uh, one thing was an article in the Harvard Crimson when he was an undergraduate at Harvard. And the title of the article is, A Conservative But Still a Nice Guy. <laughs> Um, then he was, uh, he's a member of the American Historical Association, which is the Association of Professional Historians, and um, he was asked in this monthly spotlight that features uh, one historian a month, uh, what books he would recommend to his fellow uh, hist historians. And after listing a couple of books, uh, he then said, Anything that reminds students and professors that all of us are fallible human beings is valuable. History should encourage humility, after all. And I think that really tells you both what kind of historian Ron is and what kind of human being. So please welcome Ron Granieri. <laughs> Gosh, thank you, Alan. That was. That was awfully nice. I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a minute to relax now. After I heard him mention that he looked me up on Google, I, was, my, I had a moment of uh, waiting to hear what he was going to refer to. But that was awfully, that's very nice. Uh, I appreciate that. And I, uh, I'm, uh, I, I'm, of course, very grateful to the Liberty Museum, to the Ginsburg Family Foundation, uh, but especially to FPRI and to Alan for the invitation to speak to you tonight. It's been a great privilege for me to work with FPRI and to be at these various events. Now, anybody who knows me would tell you that uh, you, Alan didn't have to convince me all that hard to host <laughs> Geopolitics with Granary, but it's nice of him to at least suggest that they had to do that. Um, but I, uh, I welcome the opportunity to speak to you all tonight, and I really appreciate you all coming out on this you know, surprisingly nice but still rather cold winter uh, late afternoon to come and, and uh, speak to you tonight. Because as we... Uh, celebrate the 60th anniversary of FPRI, and 60 is a nice round number. This is an appropriate time for us to consider the intellectual foundations of the project uh, and to think about what the history of FPRI has to tell us about its future. Uh, um, although the remarks I'm about to make might not always show it, um, I've been giving a lot of thought to the meaning of geopolitics uh, and what we at FPRI hope to accomplish in our efforts to encourage our particular approach to the study of international relations and current events. 
So what I hope to do tonight, uh, in the time that I have, is to sketch some of the ideas that led to the creation of FPRI, uh, and also to discuss what they have to tell us about the world of today, and to borrow one of the first of many lines I'm going to borrow from Robert strauss Huppe for us to understand the balance of tomorrow. So let's begin with the most basic question that guides the lecture. So what is geopolitics, anyway? Today, as Alan just did, and as every good representative of FPRI should, they will tell you that geopolitics is a, offers a perspective on contemporary international affairs that is anchored in the study of history, geography, and culture. Or as my, my brilliant colleague uh, and future Ginsburg lecturer later on this season, Professor James Kurth has often put it, it is about the study of the realities and mentalities of the localities. <laughs> That's all very true, and of course, since it was said by Professor Kurth, it was also very well said. Um, and it emphasizes our efforts at FPRI to make international relations understandable through encouraging a deeper appreciation of the longer term forces at work in the world. None of the crises that splash across your newspaper or these days more appropriately your Facebook feed came out of nowhere. Right? All of them, even if they have specific contemporary sparks are rooted in the flow of history, the legacies of local culture, and of course, the concrete reality of geography. There are deeper reasons, you know, more than just what happened last week, why the contemporary world faces conflicts between Russia and Ukraine, between Turkey and Syria, or Iran and Saudi Arabia, just as there are quite sensible reasons why we rarely discuss the possibility of tensions between Madagascar and New Zealand, or Kazakhstan and Chile. Geopolitical analysis starts with a map, but it doesn't end there. Through the study of geopolitics, or through the geopolitical approach to international relations, FPRI aims to illuminate and elucidate, not to make the world appear simple, because it is not simple, but rather, to provide insights that will allow educated citizens to grapple confidently with the complexities of the everyday world. So much for, for FPRI's current understanding of geopolitics. At the same time, however, the word geopolitics and the science, as some people like to call it, has a specific historical cultural background that we should take a moment to understand if we hope to appreciate how it has developed as a concept and a school of thought, as well as how it relates to other efforts to understand international affairs. The concept of geopolitics has its roots in the decades between 1880 and 1910. This was an era of big think, as scholars and popularizers combining their sense of awe at the technological and social accomplishments of the century that was coming to an end, with they combined that with a deep sense of foreboding about what the new century was likely to bring. And they attempted to draw conclusions from the broad sweep of world history in search of the one thing that explained it all. This is the era of big world histories, of the search for systemic explanations. This is the atmosphere that not only gave us the further development of Marxism as a uh, body of political and social thought, but also the, cult, the atmosphere that produced such works of gloomy genius as Brooks Adams's Law of Civilization and Decay, or, uh, more famously, the Prussian granddaddy of all depressing world historical works, um, Oswald Spengler's Der Untergang des Abendlandes, The Decline of the West. What those works had in common was a mania for systemization and this search for the key to understanding how humanity had developed. Right. The combination of technological and political and social advances in the late 19th century had led people to believe that it was possible to find out what that one thing was that explained why the world was the way it was, especially as the world got increasingly complicated. This is an, this is an important thing to remember. The more complicated the world gets, the more simple people wish it would be. And it is always that, that challenge out there for anybody who thinks of themselves as a particularly deep thinker or a particular philosopher, that they're going to be the person who's going to put their finger on the one thing that explains it all. And one such work of historical strategic big think from this era was written by the American Captain Alfred Thayer Mahon, 
The Influence of Sea Power on History, 1660 to 1783, the first edition of which was published in 1890, which, as the title suggests, argues that the rise of Britain to world power and the potential key to dominance of his native USA as a rising world power was due to control of the seas. That Britain's defeat of the Dutch and eventual defeat of the French and the, the developments of the 19th century was all because of Britain's sea power. This was Mahan's philosopher's stone. Right? This was the key that explained how great powers became great powers. They became great powers because they controlled the seas, because they had great navies. This, of course, appealed greatly to people in Great Britain because it provided a world historical objective explanation for why they were so gosh darn terrific. Um, it, was very, it was very popular in the United States because that was the way that a lot of of Anglophile, Anglophile members of the American defense and foreign policy elite, such as existed in 1890. They imagined themselves following in the footsteps of the British Empire. And they imagined that the Navy was the way to do that, even though, of course, ironically, it's hard to leave footsteps in water. Um, it was also very popular in Germany, where Kaiser Wilhelm II, who hoped to build a Navy to pursue his particular vision of Weltpolitik, world policy, are ordered that a copy of the book be placed in every warship in the German Navy so that the officers could pull it down like the Bible and read about why they should be preparing for the next Battle of Trafalgar. So for Mahan, <clears throat> a state's ability to support and interdict commerce was crucial to success in the modern world. And it explained why some powers had risen while others had failed. There was, however, a question that was looming even when he was writing this book. The question of whether the control of the sea, which was so important in the 17th and 18th centuries, when overland travel was much more arduous and most economic development, most population, most commerce did indeed happen close to the sea coasts and on navigable waterways, whether that would still hold true in the era of the telegraph and the railroad, which of course was well underway by 1890. And indeed, um, Mahan's stab at Big Think inspired a counter movement embodied by a January 1984 paper, 1904 paper, I should say, 1904 paper, by the British geographer Halford Mackinder, who spoke before the Royal Geographical Society on the geographical pivot of history. Mackinder turned Mahan on his head. While he, might have re while he recognized that sea power had been very important, Mackinder argued that industrialization and new technology not only made the conquest and exploitation of resources inland easier and more effective, but also since such developments could occur far from the seacoast, it was more important to control the inland areas than it was to control the seas. And of course for Mackinder, he was very much focused on the idea of Eurasia, what he called the heartland, the center of the world island that was planet Earth. That control of the heartland was the main prize in international politics. Now, ideas about geography, of course, had been around, right? There was a Royal Geographical Society when Mackinder spoke to them. Uh, uh, but the, Mackinder's idea and his emphasis on geography and the, the role of control of the land that would make you impregnable, essentially, to assault from the sea. Um, this is the beginning of the, and the popularity of the term geopolitics, right, to explain international politics based on geography. Now, <clears throat> Mackinder's effort to reduce strategy and history to one factor, right, control of the heartland rather than control of the seas, was in, in some ways as problematic as Mahan's efforts to emphasize navies. And it's definitely an artifact of its time. But that doesn't make it completely illogical, nor did its reductionism keep it from having profound practical consequences for both the intellectual and political life of the decades that followed. The idea that control of the world island would mean world power had special appeal for Germans in particular, who long dreamed of Mitteleuropa, right? the idea that control of Central Europe was the basis for a larger empire. And indeed, the experience of the First World War, in which Germany did suffer because of the British blockade, had led many Germans to speculate on that Germany would be better off seeking a kind of autarkic empire 
based on Eurasia. And prominent in the circles of people who began to think this way was a Munich professor and former general, Karl Haushofer, who had been developing such ideas on his own and developed a series of lectures on what he called geopolitik, you know, geopolitics, um, at the University of Munich. Those lectures had enthralled a young student named Rudolf Hess. Rudolf Hess, who then encouraged his, uh, his new hero, Adolf Hitler, to listen to Haushofer, to read his works, and to talk about him. Hess established contacts between them, um, and Haushofer's development of his ideas of geopolitics merged with already existing ideas of this need for Germany to expand to the East, the concept of Lebensraum, living space in the East. Um, there are some scholars who try to argue that Haushofer was the first man to popularize this term. That's actually a rather controversial uh, comment. Um, but the, the idea of the need for expansion, for control of this large empire, was already out there among proto-Nazi and nationalist movements in interwar Germany. Haushofer's writings lent a degree of intellectual cachet to an ideological and ultimately genocidal program. Now, it's not completely clear how much specific influence Haushofer's writings had on the Nazi leadership. It's never very clear how much practical politicians read essays by academics, as academics know all too well. Also, as academics know all too well, academics like to believe that academics are very important. And so Haushofer's writings actually became a subject of a great deal of debate and discussion. And you can find, a, you know, you can find books that, that emphasize the importance of Haushofer as a, as a particular threat, that his ideas are a threat. And an appreciation of the importance of those ideals, what they meant for, for German policy, but also what they implied for the world. This is what motivated former stockbroker, bon vivant, man of the world, uh, newly established professor of international politics, lecturer in international politics, I should say, at the University of Pennsylvania, Robert strauss Huppe, um, to write a counterblast to German Geopolitics. In 1942, strauss Huppe publishes his first major work, Geopolitics, the Struggle for Space and Power, in which he points out the danger of Haushofer's ideas, but accepted the importance of his premises. Now, strauss Huppe argued that the Germans had developed Geopolitik as a new approach to international relations, which focused on the importance of conquest and domination of a vast autarkic, so independent, economically independent space, rather than simply working within a traditional European state system. Right, so this was what strauss Huppe saw as the main innovation of this concept of geopolitics, that it didn't respect traditional sovereign state boundaries, didn't respect particular nation, uh, uh, nation state interests. Right? Germany was, by virtue of these theories about the need to control this vast space, right? Germany was moving into a, an imperial vision. And it was control of this large space was more important than just success in governing this state or that or gaining this small piece of territory or that. <clears throat> Strauss-Huppé Strauss -Huppé recognized that how much Haushofer's ideas relied on Mackinder. And he also realized that there was a reason why Mackinder's approach was so appealing to the Germans. As he wrote in a critical jab at both the Germans and Mackinder, um, there is, a, there is in Mackinder's dogma just the kind of finality for which the Wagnerian mentality yearns. Right? Because the idea is you get this empire and you win. You control the world. You control the world island. You control the world. So strauss Huppé wanted to write to warn about that this is what the Germans thought. But at the same time, he, wanted, uh, he saw this particular vision of the world as plausible and a perhaps unavoidable but threatening reality. Charting the emergence of what he called an epoch of a new and global struggle for power, strauss Huppé foresaw a new world divided into power blocks dominated by the strongest surviving nations. Power depended on the control of space, since new technology and economic development required ever more space with, within which to operate. The result, strauss Huppé warned, was there could be no stable world order. There is only one certainty, everlasting Struggle. Strauss-Huppé wrote his book in 1942 as a spur 
for an isolationist United, US opinion, to understand the need for a global perspective, and to understand that what happened in the heartland had consequences for the United States that could not be ignored or wished away. Thus, he argued for an approach to international relations that took into account these geographical realities and the new power politics that did not respect the existing borders of states and nations. The United States, strauss Huppe argued, could not stand idly by while the Germans and Japanese seized control of Mackinder's heartland. Isolation offered no security. On the contrary, the United States needed to help organize a counter-struggle in concert with the British and the French to push back this threat of world domination. As he concludes his book, he says, even if geopolitics were simply the German blueprint for world conquest and nothing else, it would be worth studying. But it is far more than that. Granted in full all of its sinister aberrations, it remains a challenge to our conception of world policy. Indeed, by realizing, by recognizing these new realities, the United States and its allies could turn the German conception back on the Nazis. With their vast space and power potential, he concluded, the United Nations have only to organize by planned and concerted effort their space and power to win the Second World War. Thus, Robert strauss Huppe in 1942. Now, strauss Huppe's geographical focus and his attempt to trace new scientific laws and approaches to international relations made it relatively easy for him to transition from the Second World War to the Cold War. The adversary may have changed, but the contest was the same. The Soviet Union was, from the perspective of geopolitics, the, at least as much of a threat to the United States as Nazi Germany. After all, the Soviet Union embodied a big chunk of Mackinder's heartland. Its control of Eurasia required an American response that would organize its part of the world and, if possible, meet and roll back the Soviet challenge. So from that point on, strauss Huppe made it his life's work to guarantee that the United States would not lose sight of this global role. His appointment to the Political Science Department at Penn and eventually the founding of FPRI in 1955 depended upon the contacts and support he could draw from those who shared his conviction that the new world required a sustained American commitment to build and lead an Atlantic community. This effort was not uncontroversial, especially as conflicts over American foreign policy intensified in the 1960s, especially focused on the debate over the Vietnam War. By the time those doctrinal differences led to FPRI severing its formal relationship with the University of Pennsylvania in 1970, strauss Huppe and FPRI had absorbed repeated criticisms for an overly hawkish and pessimistic approach to world affairs. Some critics blamed the geopolitical focus itself for this tendency as its assumptions about protracted conflict, a term that, uh, strauss -Huppe, that was the title of a collection of essays written by strauss Huppe and William Faltzgraf and William Kintner early in the history of FPRI, that this perpetuated the idea that peace was an illusion and conflict was a constant. Such criticisms are not unfamiliar today, though over the years, right, strauss Huppe's efforts to encourage an understanding of international relations that emphasizes geography and culture, history, um, has proven to be a valuable lens through which to understand contemporary international affairs. Now, the biography of geopolitics as a concept, and strauss Huppe's biography also, are fascinating subjects in themselves. The larger question for us tonight, though, is what, are, what use are we to make of geopolitics? What does it mean? What does it do? Uh, or more broadly, what's the point of any uh, intellectual framework for understanding international politics? It's perfectly natural for those who hope to influence policy, to want to construct intellectual frameworks that will not merely describe the past, but offer a model for the future. To borrow a term from the political scientist Christopher Fetweiss, who's writing in an upcoming article for Orbis, a worthwhile theory must be descriptive, prescriptive, and predictive to have real value. But can we truly expect any model to do all of those things equally well? I'm going to take a moment here and venture into very dangerous territory, a bloody crossroads more strewn with victims and marked by conflict than any between states, the conflict between historians and political scientists over the study of international relations. The short version of this conflict is the struggle for the intellectual high ground, 
Historians claim that their emphasis on the specific and the particular makes them better able to describe the world as it has been, and by extension, the world as it is and is likely to be. Through the collection and analysis of specific examples, historians emphasize complexity and the particular. Political scientists, however, often dismiss the fixation on the specific and particular as dangerously antiquarian. For them, historical facts are of value not in themselves, but primarily as the building blocks for models for understanding international relations. Now, there are dangers in the extreme versions of both the historical and political science models. Historians can indeed become hypnotized by the particular and become unable to draw larger conclusions. The mere accumulation of information, followed by the claim that nothing is exactly like anything else, and that thus no comparisons are possible or justified, doesn't help anybody. And it actually makes historians no fun at parties. And it also threatens to create the kind of vast and unwieldy projects that were so well, um, so well lampooned by George Eliot in, uh, in her great novel, Middlemarch, where she describes the aged Mr. Casaubon who decides to spend his life writing a compendium of all mythologies all throughout history, a project that he's never able to end, and he actually threatens to dump on his poor, long-suffering wife, Dorothea, until she realizes that she doesn't have to do it. Political science, their part, are occasionally uh, susceptible to the Procrustean temptation, as I call it. The idea that if something doesn't quite fit in your model, you can cut off a little piece here or stretch a little piece there and get it to fit exactly where it goes, just as the ancient uh, traveler Theseus met the man Procrustes who said he had a bed that fit every man. It was a narrow plank, and if you were too short for it, he would stretch you. If you were too long for it, he would chop you in pieces. I've been in the academic business long enough to know the contours of this long-running frozen conflict. Um, and I'm here, actually, to argue for peace. What we need is an approach that emphasizes both the variety of human experience uh, and the need for us to systematize, to draw conclusions, to make comparisons, and even even though we should be very, very careful how we do this, even occasionally to try to predict the future. As long as we recognize we are likely to be wrong, we may actually think hard enough to get things right. So this would be a historically informed theory or approach that seeks to explain political action while remaining aware of the uncertainties of the future. What we need in both our approaches to politics and our approaches to theory is, as Alan suggested in the introduction, a sense of humility, a recognition of limits. Geopolitics, as developed by Strauss-Soupe and as practiced by the FPRI, reflects an initial effort at just such humility. Through the careful sifting of information, the balancing of the material and intellectual realities of geography and history, and the larger verities of human nature, we can understand how the world works in ways that will enrich us all. Strauss-Huppé, whose personal background and varied professional career provided plenty of reasons for him to be skeptical about the inevitability of progress and the predictability of human events, was realistic. But he was not necessarily a realist with a capital R, as that concept is understood in the formal study of international relations. This is worth noting, since some terms are thrown around um, in ways that, uh, that, have, that have bigger meanings depending on the audience in which you um, in which, to which you're speaking. Realism as a school of thought in international politics is a theory most closely connected with the works of such legendary uh, political scientists as Kenneth Waltz, continues to be advanced by his students and acolytes such as uh, John Mearsheimer and Stephen Walt and many others. And in full disclosure, John Mearsheimer was one of my professors when I was a graduate student at the University of Chicago. And uh, while I don't always agree with him, he's about the smartest man I've ever heard speak. Um, but realism, um, actually, he's the old, actually there is one person who's smarter, and that's somebody who is not here but is connected to FPRI. That would be Walter McDougall. I wanted to make sure I got that on the record. So, um, Not that I expect him to actually watch this video, but he might. Realism emphasizes the competition between states within an anarchic international system and their constant search for power and more power relative advantage over the other. 
Realism's focus on power and system level analyses often means that realists tend to emphasize the commonalities between sovereign states across both space and time, treating their domestic arrangements or even the ideologies they claim to defend as more or less honest fig leaves for their real interests. Even though its codification as a school of thought is a product of the specializing second half of the 20th century, realism can trace its roots to a long tradition of practical or cynical statesmen who focused on advancing the interests of their particular realms, from Niccolo Machiavelli to Cardinal Richelieu, uh, who spoke of French raison d'etat, to Otto von Bismarck, who spoke of realpolitik. Realism is a favorite posture among those who consider themselves hard-nosed enough to see the world as it is. George Kennan, for example, placed himself in this camp when he postulated that the one problem with American foreign policy was too much emphasis on moralism and legalism. But even realism has its blinders. An emphasis on the sovereignty and independence of states as the sine qua non of understanding international affairs, leave, not only leaves discussions of the relative merits of the domestic arrangements of states out of the equation, but also can be blind to the very different motivations behind states such as Richelieu's France, say, and Nazi Germany, or between Richelieu's France and Barack Obama's United States of America. Sovereign states, yes. Pursuing power and interests, sure. But their definitions of interests and their conceptions of how to perceive them they are different. They are not all the same. Each state may indeed be pursuing power, but their definitions of power and appreciations of the practical and intellectual limits of power are not always identical across space and time. <clears throat> Realism, as a, made with a capital R, can also feed a special sort of contempt for the political interests that may be at work within states, especially when dealing with democracies, where foreign policy is subject to uh, political debate, some of which is admittedly less well-informed than others, and can be influenced by short-term tactical considerations as much as any well-thought-out grand strategy. Sometimes, realists can fall into the trap of imagining that they are the only rational actors and into the equally dangerous causal assumption that any alternative approach to international problems, advanced by those interests that the realists do not recognize, are somehow corrupt, or self-interested, purely self-interested, as well as unrealistic. Kennan himself ran into this problem in his later years when he revealed himself to be much more cynical and contemptuous of democracy in the United States than he would have wanted anybody to know. Uh, for Kennan, he ended up rejecting the, many of the values of the American Republic he worked to defend. In the case of Mearsheimer and Walt, it can lead to the rather disproportionate result of them raining anathemas upon domestic American political interest groups such as APAC, who act within a vibrant democratic debate while offering bland abstract justifications for the actions of an authoritarian, authoritarian oligarch such as Vladimir Putin. Now, Robert strauss Pace foresaw problems with theories that reduced diplomacy and politics merely to the pursuit of power. In his 1956 book-length essay, Power and Community, Strauss-Huppé questioned whether power in the abstract made sense as an organizing principle for either the intellectual study of international relations or for political practice. For Strauss-Huppé, power only made sense within the larger context of a society's values and intentions. To assume otherwise, or to hope to make understanding of complexities of politics easier simply by focusing on power in himself, was for him an example of the, quote, single factor fallacy. Whenever power is removed from the context of legitimate authorities, he wrote, authorities which people accept as divinely ordained or stemming from a freely entered contract, whenever power is removed from that context, it cannot affect social change. It cannot build. It cannot secure its own foundations. It can only destroy and ultimately destroy itself. Power's significance for Strauss-Huppé lay in what a society chose to do with its power and the ideas that animate social action. Strauss-Huppé rejected philosophies that, quote, profess to shun metaphysics, that is, to take things as they are, and to substitute know-how for philosophical insight. To place too much emphasis on efficiency, he wrote, is the supreme boast of totalitarianism. To substitute know-how 
skill in the management of men and things for truth is to strip human life of dignity and meaning. Modern societies need technological competence, just as societies need to understand the workings of power. But no amount of technical competence can take the place of that element which raises an assembly of men and tools to the dignity of the community. This element is moral solidarity. The quest for community is the quest for spiritual values, the ageless ideas of all men and all cultures. And it is futile, if not pernicious, to apply scientific methods which are not informed and guided by an encompassing moral vision. In the context of the Cold War, strauss hupe saw that power only made sense as a confederal project in which the states of the West overcame their national divisions and worked together to defend their values. strauss hupe recognized the importance of states but was skeptical about the value of nationalism. The creative force of nationalism has been exhausted for a long time, he wrote in an essay for the very first issue of Orbis called The Balance of Tomorrow. Nationalism was the greatest retrogressive force of the century. Instead, he argued for the establishment of a Western community of nations led by the United States. As he concluded power and community, in this age, the councils of national interest and national security are false councils. For Western nations, the use of force is justified to no other purpose than the defense of human liberty. The use of force for any other purpose is a craven blasphemy. Human liberty is the indivisible possession of all Western people. None can defend it behind national frontiers. None can abridge it without abridging it everywhere. The defense of freedom is thus a fraternal, a federal, a federative enterprise. That enterprise confers justice and nobility upon the uses of power. Furthermore, as an extension of his vision for an American-led world order, strauss hupe saw great value in European integration, in the European project generally. Unlike many contemporary skeptics, including many soi-disant realists, who believe that a recognition of power politics means a rejection of the European idea, strauss hupe saw power politics and the European idea as natural complements. He expressed both his hope and his confidence that realities would compel the rulers of the one-time great powers of Western Europe to exchange their precarious claim to independent policies for a general European policy. An integrated Europe was most consistent with the American ideal, American declaratory policy, and American security. Such a Europe would fill a strategic vacuum and would also provide the United States with an economically and politically strong partner in the world. This is very far from the ostentatiously amoral realism of many foreign policy theorists and even more commentators on international relations who view culture as a sideshow and domestic politics as a distraction from the real thing. This is what makes geopolitics, as developed by Strauss-Huppé and, and developed by his colleagues at FPRI, rather different from the realism practiced elsewhere. It also means that simply attributing everything to power is far from the end of our understanding of the international arena. Context matters. And that means those who want to understand the world need to put in the effort to understand the context. Cultural and social as well as political, linguistic as well as economic. What does all this mean for us as we consider concrete cases? Let's take just a, a moment to look at Ukraine today a conflict taking place precisely in the middle of Halford Mackinder's heartland. From a purely realist perspective, current Russian policy in the region makes perfect sense. A great power always wants to extend its sphere of influence. One should therefore not be surprised about Russia's actions, nor should one expect that anyone can do much about it. Indeed, the realist argument has consistently been that the United States should focus, as a great power, solely on its relationship with Russia as another great power which means that the interests and desires of smaller states in the region, from Poland or the Baltic Republics to Georgia or Ukraine itself, are less significant than that great power relationship and should not be allowed to get in the way. 
For that reason, the expansion of NATO, even if it was at least as much the result of Eastern European pull as American push, was always a bad idea, say the realists. Similarly, any reservations about the nature of the Russian state or the kind of states it hopes to develop along its periphery are at best an irrelevant distraction and at worst dangerous delusions. This realist interpretation of the situation in Ukraine is not necessarily inaccurate, but it is incomplete. It offers parsimony, a term that all theorists hope to uh, attribute to their theories, which is ideal for a respectable theory, but it offers no depth. A geopolitical perspective would also take into account an awareness of the regional historical tensions between Russia and Ukraine, not to mention the other neighbors in the region, and also consider the nature of American commitments to the region within the context of broader American intentions and values. If power only has significance when it is related to society's highest aspirations, then decisions about its exercise cannot be made by simply factoring those issues out of the equation. It may very well be that the policy prescriptions that would come out of either a realist or an FPRI geopolitical interpretation of the situation in Ukraine, that the actual policy prescriptions might very well be similar. This is a question I hope that you will raise with my brilliant colleague, Jakob Gregel, who will be a later speaker in the uh, Ginsburg series. But decisions made on a richer understanding of the situation would be both intellectually preferable and politically more sensible. <clears throat> Much of the discussion of spheres of influence when people talk about Russia and Ukraine gets us back to the issue of geography, which plays a complicated role in FPRI's conception of geopolitics. Of course, it is an essential component. FPRI and its scholars are often in the forefront whenever anyone decries the weaknesses of public understanding of geography or the teaching of geography or when propagating the potential revenge of geography, to use the title of an excellent book by Robert Kaplan. The danger, however, with reducing geopolitics simply to geography is the temptation to assume permanence and inevitability to human existence. Because after all, outside of the Chicago River, which was made to flow backwards by the Army Corps of Engineers to build the sanitary canal in Chicago, or the reclamation of land from the North Sea by the determined Dutch. There have been few examples of societies being able to substantially reverse the geography of their homelands, which would suggest there is permanence and inevitability to geography and to the political conclusions you could draw from geography. <clears throat> now, no doubt, an appreciation of geographical realities and their significance is important to help us appreciate the looming possibilities of conflict. Think of the Strait of Hormuz, or the Strait of Malacca, or the crowded South China Sea, or even access to oil and gas fields in different parts of the world, each of which in their own way can be the source of significant conflict. But as with a single focus on the abstract notion of power, a focus on the simple reality of geography leaves out important considerations about the nature of the states in question their relations with each other, and the possibilities they represent. Oil fields, for example, may be valuable potential sources of conflict. But no one really expects North Dakota and Saskatchewan to go to war with each other over the Bakken Shale anytime soon. The point here is not that power relationships are irrelevant or that geography doesn't matter. The danger that we face is when we study international relations and we pursue a reductionism that either tries to isolate the one factor that will explain everything or which throws up one's hands at understanding anything. So right, our da the dangers of, of either reductionism or one damn thing after anotherism. We need to try to avoid those two. The greatest constant in international affairs is, of course, human folly and weakness. But the nature of, those, of that constant and its impact on human life changes. Human beings are surprisingly inventive in finding out things to be wrong about. And they do occasionally get things right. right? Positive change does happen. Right? The problem with assuming an inevitability or an immutability of politics cannot account for change. As frustrating and sometimes depressing as human life can be, we should not give up the effort to understand our surroundings or to try to forecast and build a better future. Perhaps there is no purpose to human activity. I hope not. Perhaps the purpose is so abstract and banal, the search for power and dominance, that it offers no inspiration or meaning. 
I don't happen to think so. Human beings are certainly weak and awful, and there are plenty of reasons to despair. It's actually interesting to think about that in, in realism, there's a lot of talk about the idea of individual sovereign states are black boxes, right? You don't, you don't need to look at what goes on inside the individual state or the individual box. You need to work with how they relate to each other. Um, I was on my way over here, it occurred to me that the, the proper metaphor really for states or for individuals, we're not black boxes, right? At the risk of sounding cliched, we are Pandora's boxes. <laughs> right? We're full of all kinds of terrible things. But I, were, but I will hasten to remind you that when Pandora opened the box and all the evils in the world rushed out and then she slammed it shut, she heard a tapping from the inside and there was still one last thing remaining inside the box. Hope. The only thing that makes all the evils in the world manageable and acceptable. Considering the imagination and creativity of human beings that have overcome so many limitations in the history of mankind. We crossed the seas that Mahan considered essential. We crossed the mountains and rivers of Mackinder's heartland. We overcame totalitarianism and communism. We still struggle with problems, but we have made quite a bit of progress. When we keep that in mind, any approach to international relations that suggests permanence or inevitability is refuted by our own human experience. Furthermore, we should not hope that any particular approach to, in, to analyzing international affairs will relieve us from the responsibility to think. As H.L. Mencken famously wrote, explanations exist for everything. They have existed for all time. There is always a well-known solution to every human problem. Neat, plausible and wrong. <laughs> the challenge for human beings is to overcome our desire for quick, neat, plausible and wrong responses and to seek rather understanding. This is all why FPRI considers its contribution to geopolitics to be expressed in the effort to instruct and discuss rather than simply categorize and assert. Everything we do from our sponsorship of research projects to our history institutes, even to geopolitics with Granary, aims to help our members and the general public appreciate the complexity of the world, which will then help them interpret what they see and act accordingly. Robert strauss hupe was a practical thinker, to be sure. His initial warnings about the threat posed by Nazi geopolitik and his constant sober warnings about the nature of the protracted conflict that the West faced with the Soviets clearly reflect, reflect that. But he was also a cultured man who understood and valued the beauty of human existence as one would expect from somebody from Vienna. He understood culture as a vital belief that gives meaning to human physical accomplishments. Tools and forms serve man to attain his purpose on earth, he wrote, a purpose that is not in these objects themselves, nor in their making, but in the fulfillment of the cultural mission. Now, FPRI has long used as, as its tagline, strauss Hupe's comment, a nation must think before it acts. Thinking has to come before decisions, decisions before actions. The value of any approach to studying international affairs lies not in how well it predetermines actions, but rather in how well it trains the mind to be able to process the welter of information that bombards any responsible citizen, any responsible leader. There are no magic formulas that will guarantee wisdom or success. Any approach to international relations is a tool. Any tool is only as good or bad as the person who wields it, and a wise person understands that possessing a variety of tools is better than relying on only one. Geography, history, and culture are some of the tools FPRI combines in its approach to geopolitics. Our relative success in how well we use those tools has brought us together as a community of scholars and learners. It's brought us together here tonight, and we hope it will bind us together in the future. We must begin by understanding the world as it is and as it has been before we can hope to build the world we want to see. Thank you very much.
<laughs> My only regret is that Ron never met Robert strauss Pay, but I think strauss Pay would have taken real delight in that lecture. <laughs> anyway, we're open for questions. Eli is carrying the mic. Please speak in. Please wait till the microphone comes to you and speak directly into the microphone. <clears throat> Uh, thank you. That was a great talk. I really enjoyed it. Thanks. And, and I'm sorry to ask this question, do this to you, but I'm wondering uh, what you would uh, uh, say in terms of a geopolitical uh, approach to understanding, let's see, a, uh, an approach has to be descriptive, <laughs> prescriptive, and, and predictive. predictive. Right. right. Uh, in terms of ISIS. In terms of ISIS. Yeah. yeah. So geography, history, culture. Right. And then those three tasks of theory. And I know I've set you up for another whole talk here. But you have. Yes. Well, but here, I, but I, will, I will give you. I'll give you a short answer to this. I mean, one is to understand that ISIS didn't. The ISIS didn't spring out of the ground. It's not like uh, Jason and the Argonauts, where you sow dragon's teeth and an army comes out of the desert floor. Right. That that we can only understand the existence of ISIS as the product of political decisions and policies in the past. That's one thing to keep in mind. Um, we do need to understand the religious motivation of ISIS, as the recent cover story in the Atlantic Monthly suggests. Um, although at the same time, we have to realize that this is a, this is much a conflict within Islam as it is between Islam and anybody else. I, I suspect and I wonder whether the recent decision by ISIS to pursue such an aggressively anti-Christian campaign as they are pursuing, whether this is less a, an indication of what they've always wanted to do as much as it is a desire to rally the, the Muslim world um, into belief that it is us against them. And frankly, the West needs to be smart enough not to rise to that bait, even if we can be, even if we, even if we can be clear about, what's, about the, the element of religious motivation and what ISIS is doing. And so, I, I could think of a theoretical explanation that would say that if you let Iraq and Syria fall apart, the geography, a um, lot of wide open spaces, means that all you have to do is control a couple of towns and the roads in between them and you can, it looks like you're bigger than you are. Um, the, the collapse of political order in that region has created a vacuum which has led to this. Any long-term strategy dealing with ISIS, while it will have to involve some degree of fighting ISIS, will also have to be built around the political reconstruction of the region. And that's not something that we're going to be able to solve from today till tomorrow. And that's not something that we should expect that not only do should we, we can't expect air, air power to solve that, we also can't expect putting boots on the ground for six weeks to solve it either. Because this is long term. And, and one could argue, and this is one of the things that, jo that George Kennan got right about the United States, one of his criticisms about the way that the United States tends to pursue foreign policy. We have a very short attention span. And solving a problem like ISIS will take having a much longer attention span. That didn't really answer your question, but it did respond to it. So there you go. <laughs> That's okay. Ron, it seems to me, following up on that same light, it seems to me. <clears throat> that although FPRI's solution and process seems very well, very good, you're fighting an uphill battle with the general public. There's a limited amount of people who go through, are the audience of FPRI, we can't get the general public to read long form political discussions, TV, looks for taglines and short little answers, saying that power for power's sake is important is a good tagline. It is indeed a good tagline. And I think that's where we're going culturally. Mm -hmm. And how do you overcome that? Ooh. How do we overcome that? I mean, this, one of the, one of the complexities about studying international affairs we're talking about it in any society, is that rarely in human history have international affairs actually been of interest to more than a small percentage of any population. Most people have better things to do with their time. Um, and this, is, this can become especially a problem in a, large, in a large democracy like the United States where a lot of people are pulled in a lot of different directions. Um, I'm try, I don't want to give a flip answer to your question because it's a good one. The question, not, maybe not the answer. 
But, um, but the, the most important thing that you can do in trying to encourage a more reasoned debate about international affairs is not to stop trying. Um, that it is true that lots of people will tune out, that many people will turn out. Many people would prefer a simple explanation. Many people would prefer to believe that you can bomb your way out of a problem. Or many people would prefer to believe that when things go badly, they go badly because whoever was in charge, who they don't like anyway, is somehow either stupid or evil. I mean, one, of the more, one of the most difficult things to, to appreciate is that bad things happen a lot when people are actually making a good faith effort to do things right. Um, and so what we can do you know, in the sort of light a candle rather than curse the darkness approach at FPRI is what we try to do is to try to find as many different ways as possible to reach the public in the hope that we can contribute to the conversation, even if we know that the conversation is not always going to turn out uh, the way that we might like it to turn out. And that's, I think this is an important thing too. What makes, what makes FPRI as an organization different from an organization that has a more explicitly ideological perspective is FPRI is, as much as everybody likes to win arguments, right? FPRI's primary interest is not to win this or that policy argument. But it's to make sure that the, that the argument of the debate as it goes on is, is well informed. And yeah, it might be that certainly individual authors and, and maybe even the majority of the people working for FPRI might want things to go one way or another. But our success is not measured by how many congressional votes we win. Right? Our success is measured by how well we feel like we're actually living up to our responsibility to educate and inform the public. How does geopolitical analysis inform the political decision about whether the United States in pursuing its foreign policy should support totalitarian hmm. governments a la Egypt and Saudi Arabia, right. as opposed to democracy. Well, it can, how it has worked in the past and how it continues to work is, is uh, sometimes as a council of, of uh, small r realism that within a certain area where there is not a strong, there, where there is either not a vibrant democratic culture or whether there are strong divisions um, that would make the, uh, make the creation of a stable representative government possible that this can lead to the belief that it is, a, it is a, uh, an acceptable shortcut to support uh, an authoritarian regime. But we, but we do come back to Strauss-Huppé's warnings and the, our own warnings that we should not forget our own values when we are deciding who our friends are. Um, one of the interesting things to look at, especially uh, since the late 1980s, is how the United States responded to, uh, uh, in, 19, in 1986, for example, an example that's often given, the United States faced uh, when there was a substantial uh, change within, within the Philippines, an old friend in the Marcos regime was clearly f uh, falling behind, and, all, and even in a place that was less strategically significant like Haiti, that one of the important and under, un, underappreciated decisions of the Reagan administration in 1986 was to, um, to let the dictators go, to drop them and to show that it was possible for the United States to, uh, to encourage democratic change uh, with limited negative consequences for the, for the United States, that, there wasn't, that we didn't need to be wedded to the idea that only a dictator can save us. One could argue that those decisions in 1986 helped to contribute to the further democratization of places like South Korea and Taiwan, which have now become very successful and vibrant democratic states. Um, they also contributed to the way that the United States uh, reacted to the revolutions of 1989. Because remember, right, as much as the United States, as much as many people in the United States wanted, wanted to win the Cold War, um, there were some capital R realists in Washington and elsewhere who argued that we shouldn't be encouraging the breakup of the Eastern Bloc because this would be bad for the stability of Europe. Um, and that we shouldn't be allowing the Germans to talk about unification because this would disturb the stability of Europe. And a willingness to, and this is where our, as complex and fraught as our relationship with Egypt has been, right, the decision to, the decision to cut ties with the Mubarak regime in the hope that it would lead to 
Egypt becoming a democracy. This is a very good example of the kind of decision that didn't work out the way that anybody in Washington wanted it to work out. But I don't think it failed because people in Washington were, were uh, venal or dumb. I think it was, it was a risk that Washington, that, that the Obama administration felt was worth taking because a successful democratic pro-Western Egypt would be an awfully nice thing. Now, but here we run into the problem is, you know, that, that as, the, as the old line goes in, in, in military discussions, right, the, the, enemy, the enemy has a vote too. Just because you want something to turn out a particular way doesn't mean he's going to let you. And while I'm not talking about enemies in places like Egypt right now, but in international politics, right, the other side has a vote too. And so you can't, you need to um, avoid the assumption that you know, we can have everything turn out exactly the way we want if only we know which button to push. And it, it doesn't work that way. Thank you, everybody. Thanks very much.